Hey everybody, nice to see you. We're gonna start uh, just shortly here. My name is Chase Taran, and uh, I'm on the team for Prince for Wildlife. So today we have a very special guest. This is our second chat uh, for our new photographer spotlight series. And so we're just gonna wait for people to come in here. Um, as you guys come in, there's a chat function. Uh, I see a lot of you guys have been uh, chatting back and forth there. So first things first, let's hear where you guys are from. So in the chat, if you can introduce yourselves, uh, let us know what part of the world you're calling in from today, and then uh, maybe your favorite uh, favorite animal. So go ahead and uh, test out that chat. And I'll, I'll even uh, give you guys an example here. So here we go. Okay, African wild dogs, Jacob says, awesome. All right, so people are starting to come in, guys. Welcome, we're very excited uh, to chat. With, uh, with Misha today. And um, so as you guys come in, there's people coming in every second here. So I'm going to repeat myself. Introduce your guys' self in the chat. Uh, everybody can see that. If you want to send private messages, you can just hit the three dots and send it directly to myself or Misha. Um, so where are, you guys, uh, where are you guys calling in from today? Put that in the chat. And then uh, what, are, what is your favorite animal? Of course, Marion, welcome. <laughs> So Marion is one of the co-founders of Prince for Wildlife. So she's uh, she's watching today. She gets the day off of the chat anyways. Uh, Lily's from the UK. Norman's from Victoria. His favorite animal is a giraffe. Jacob, uh, Jacob, where are you calling in from again today? Okay. Uh, Guten Morgen. Uh, Martin's in here. We got leave. Okay, cool. Uh, Aber is uh, from Niobe. Uh, pangolin, pangolin. Awesome. Very cool. Awesome. Okay, guys, so we're going to get started today. Um, so these calls are meant to be um, short, succinct, informative, educational, and a lot of fun. Uh, this is the first time we're doing this for Prince for Wildlife. Last year, we did a little bit of this on Instagram Live. Uh, this time around, we're using a webinar platform so we could record this, so we can engage with you guys, and so we can have the replay available for you guys to watch us uh, over and over again, however many times you want. So uh, greetings, uh, Carl. Uh, welcome. And uh, thanks, Lily. Seahorse. <laughs> cool. Okay. So uh, again, my name is Chase Taran. I'm one of the uh, team members, the digital marketers of Prince for Wildlife. So I joined as a contributing photographer as well. And I love the campaign so much that uh, I offered my time to volunteer in the last couple of years. And I'm very excited uh, to be a part of the third year coming back bigger than ever uh, than last year and the year before and all doing uh, amazing things with uh, showcasing conservation spotlights all over the world uh, and of course helping African Parks Network do their thing. So uh, today we have Misha Wilcoxon. Uh, Misha is a British photographer and cinema cinematographer with a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Stanford University. So that first line alone should get you guys super curious and interested. Uh, his work is characterized by his extraordinary travels on which he attempts uh, to capture what happens uh, happens to appear before him rather than cr uh, creating contrived scenes. He has been uh, self-published by three handmade books, the first which is Death Valley 2017, uh, which originally housed in the Lock Stacks collection uh, of Bose Art and Architecture Library at Stanford University. Uh, over the past four years alone, Misha has visited 22 different countries, from roaming the plains in Namibia with lions, cheetahs, leopards, to chasing northern lights in the heart of Lapland, to hanging out to the side of hanging out at the side of a helicopter over downtown San Francisco. Uh, every day is an adventure with Misha. So before the pandemic, Misha spent most of his time uh, in South Africa working as a director of photography on film projects for National Geographic including a three parts of a six part series on baby animals. So during this time, he also worked on documentaries that were released, that were released on Apple TV plus Fox love nature, Netflix and sky TV. Uh, so these days Misha's travel is a little bit more sporadic as he prepares for his upcoming wedding in September. Uh, so most recently, some of Misha's uh, photographs have been sold uh, part of Prince for Wildlife campaign. So for the charity campaign, uh, which is the month-long fundraiser that we're doing, um, this is our third year. We're at 1.75 million uh, for wildlife conservation. So for those of you who have never heard for, of Prince for Wildlife, you know this is this is what this is all about: is uh, uh, creating uh, the ability for African parks to to do their conservation work. Um, so along alongside uh, his ph photographic and cinematographer work. Misha runs Traveler, so at Traveler, so that's on Instagram. It's a travel media agency with over 100,000 followers. 
Um, and prior to running Traveler, he actually worked for At Earth, uh, creating content, building brand partnerships, curating images uh, for many part of their social channels. So outside of photography, uh, Misha's a keen athlete uh, and he rode for Great Britain junior national team as well as Stanford University. So, I mean, quite the resume and quite the intro. Uh, welcome, Misha, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for, thanks for having me um and uh thanks for introducing me um looking forward to answering your questions and 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 other questions that might, people might have awesome so you've been a contributor uh for prince for wildlife since since the inception so the last couple of years so uh how did you get involved and what were some of the images that you contributed to the initiative um i think originally uh pi reached out to me um when he was putting together um i guess a list of of initial c contributors um asked whether i would be willing to to send um send through an image and um i think first year i i contributed a, a photo of a lioness in a tree um and then last year was a um was a uh, an elephant calf um suckling from its its mom and then this year is uh the, the plan is to contribute this image of um, of a pilot whale um, with her calf. Beautiful. Do you have that on the screen for us to, to check out? Yeah, let me just try and share my screen. And I'll, uh, I'll pin uh, your Instagram here as well for everybody to follow you. Let me know if you guys can see this. Uh, yeah, I can make it bigger. There you go. Incredible. So walk us through uh, uh, this image and, and how it was created. It's beautiful. Yeah, so uh, this um, this image is, is a pilot whale, um, not a dolphin. Uh, often um, people confuse pilot whales for dolphins. Uh, they're, they're predominantly found in, in deep water. Um, and so this was was about 10 miles off offshore. Um, we basically chartered a boat for the day. We took took it out with a, a captain who knew the area well um, and were actually predominantly looking for, for humpback whales. Um, and uh, and for a long time we we kind of weren't seeing anything. And then in the distance we we spotted what looked like it might be um, a group of either pilot whales or dolphins swimming together um, turned out to be pilot whales, um, and and so we we stopped the boat. Um, I slid in with my camera. My my fiance um, slid in with a a stick because often these um, these pilot whales swim with uh, white tip sharks and other um, other sea life that maybe you don't want checking you out. Um, and so she was kind of there. Um, to make sure nothing got too close to us, um, but yeah, these these pilot whales were were super relaxed, swimming um, on their own in a pod of about um, thirty or, or forty or so, um, with with some calves in there as well. Um, they would come up and check us out. They'd fall asleep. Um, yeah, it was a it was a pretty special experience. Um, Amazing. Now, was, where was it taken? A few uh, folks are asking here. Oh, uh, yeah, it was taken about 10 miles offshore um, of the, the big island um, in Hawaii. Beautiful. Well, it's absolutely gorgeous. And, and so were you like, what does what your uh, setup look like in terms of the, uh, the camera gear uh, that, you, that you're using? Yeah, so for, um, for underwater stuff, um, for still underwater stuff, I shoot with my um, Canon uh, Mark IV. Um, I have a, an underwater housing for that with like a dome um, casing. Typically, um, I shoot wide angle. I, I use a wide angle lens, um, and uh, that's kind of the the setup for underwater stills. Beautiful. Well, thanks. Thanks for uh, sh uh, sharing that. That's absolutely incredible. That's um, such a unique animal. And I mean, for for those of you guys who aren't aware of uh, these type of whales, it's um, 
It's a really rare encounter. So that's uh, that's a really special photo that you're contributing. So let's go back just quickly. Um, so why why did you want to contribute to Prince for Wildlife and what kind of, I guess, sparked your interest? Because I mean, there's a lot of different initiatives that, you know, kind of start and then don't, they, they don't have the, the basically the, the momentum that Prince for Wildlife has had over the last couple of years. So what initially, like looking at this idea that, that P and Marion had, uh, what, what did that, like what sparked your interest? Yeah, I, I think it was um, really just giving back to wildlife communities. I think, um, I mean, it was something that I myself had, in, I mean, in, initially the idea was to, to help um, wildlife through the pandemic. And obviously this is now extending, but um, I was kind of acutely aware of that, having worked a lot across Southern Africa with wildlife um, in lots of different wild areas. Um, and then I wasn't able to go out there and and be with these, these animals and, and see them every day. And I think um, I was acutely aware while I was out there, like how much um, a lot of the animals and a lot of the, the conservation efforts that go on are reliant on tourism in particular and how that kind of stopped overnight. Um, and so I just wanted to be able to do something while I was away from, from Southern Africa and this felt like something that I could do. Um, but yeah, I mean, more generally, like wildlife has kind of been been my life for a while. And so, um, yeah, anything and everything that I can do um, to help, uh, to help particularly with conservation, but, but just like increasing the size of, of the natural areas where wildlife can roam freely, I think is yeah. good. And I love what African parks do. And, and I think all around it, it just felt, felt like a good thing to get involved with. Uh, that's fantastic. Well, thanks for uh, sharing that. It's, um, yeah, it's something where I think, um, you know, everybody during that time in COVID were, were looking were wait for ways that they could have a positive impact. And this this was definitely that that conduit to make it happen. So that's very cool. So let's let's go back. Let's rewind a little bit about, uh, you know, your bio as I'm as I'm reading your bio and I read it several times prior to chatting. It's the first time you and I have met. Um, I'm reading this. and I'm going, OK, so he's Stanford. He's got mathematics degree. He's a cinematographer for Nat Geo, uh, Disney, Netflix, all these different things. Now, how do you go from mathematics at Stanford and and rowing uh, into into cinematography for for Nat Geo and, and the likes? Yeah, so after my freshman year at college, I I quit rowing, which gave me a, a lot more time, um, and I actually picked my mathematics degree um, because it was like the fewest number of units you could take, um, <laughs> and so it it freed up like a lot of a lot of time for me to be able to do other things. And initially um, I was working with a friend building, um, building social media accounts on various different platforms, um, a, as you mentioned um, on Instagram, but also on Twitter and, and other areas that through that. Um, so we built accounts to over a million followers. And, and I think um, this was back in 2014, 2015. Um, that was really when lots of lots of companies were looking to um people with large accounts on social media to work with and so we got lots of companies kind of from all across um all across the world reaching out asking to work together that got me kind of into professional photography until then it had really been a, a personal thing mm -hmm. um, and uh and then kind of from working professionally for um, different different people all over the world, I felt like I I wanted to do more than just lifestyle and landscape stuff and and started going more and more into um, into wildlife photography. And then by the time I graduated, I was working with various different um, lodges, um, one in particular. Um, meant that I could go back kind of whenever I wanted and, and shoot there. That allowed me to build my kind of portfolio up quite a lot as well. Um, and I was working actually at a friend's lodge in, uh, in India um, at this, in, yeah, shortly after I graduated. Um, and, and while I was there, um, some guys were working on a documentary for National Geographic on, on the Black Panther that was out in the forest there. They, 
we spent a lot of time together. We chatted a lot. They saw, they'd seen my work and they, they basically asked um, whether I wanted to come and join them shooting on, on a few different projects in, in Southern Africa and, and things kind of um, spiraled from there. And, and then it wasn't just National Geographic who, who um, we were shooting for, it was Netflix and, and a lot of others. And it's been really cool. Um, I mean, a lot of these things take a lot of time to go through post-production. Um, so for a while, it was like, oh, I shot on these documentaries and people would ask where they can go see them and there wasn't like really a, a place they could go see them. Yeah. But now it's really cool with with a lot of the work coming out um, on streaming services and stuff like that. People can go to Netflix to, to go and watch them um, or or other places, yeah. Amazing, so what, what are the, um, so I, I have a few questions about kind of that process as well, but what are some of the the uh, names of these these titles that people can check out? So, I, I mean, it kind of depends, I, I think, how into um, wildlife documentaries you are, but I, I don't know if you've seen, so in, in May, Netflix released Wild Babies, um, which, uh, which I filmed parts of the, the baby lions that you'll, you'll see in that one. Um, there's also a documentary called Animal that came out last year, or that was again like a, a multiple part series. Um, and I filmed uh, some of the the baby cheetah stuff um, that's in there. Um, so I mean, those those are the two ones that are on on Netflix at the moment. But there are a few others that came out, for example, on on Fox last year, and um, and on Apple TV. And and depending on where you are in the world, I know that you're in in Canada. Um, so one of the, the documentaries that I filmed a lot for um, was a, a show called New Kids in the Wild that was um, on Love Nature um, in Canada, and it was syndicated um, across the world. And that was three parts um, of that six part series I filmed, um, pretty much all of it, um, which were on wild dogs, cheetahs, um, and lions. And so lots and lots of days spent with uh, baby wild dogs, baby lions, and baby cheetah. That's unbelievable. Well, that's uh, that's great. We'll definitely, yeah, we'll send out an email as well after for you guys uh, to all get this. Otherwise, we'll put it in the chat in a sec. So uh, obviously, quite the uh, quite the resume with that. So quick question. So you're you're doing photography, okay? Like most of us, you know, a lot of this it's like a, a weird fine line sometimes between a hobby and a profession. That all of a sudden, you know, you're you're off and running with a whole team and crew. But in terms of like having the proper gear and, and the skills, so like photography and videography are very different. Um, they have, you know, you need a different eye. You need to have different technical know-how. In addition to a lot of these streaming services, I mean, you need to have equipment. Um, you need to have the proper equipment that's like red or nothing basically um in terms of the camera gear Were, was the crew like did they have the extra camera gear for you to use and, and go and try and test out or was it just expected that you know you you come and you have the proper gear and you're you know you know everything like what was that yeah like? yeah so it, it kind of depends on the project but mo like most of the time we would shoot with um the the main guy who i met when i was in india called um russ mclaughlin um, so he has a bunch of his own camera gear that he's he's acquired through the years. Um, I mean, the way the way that wildlife filmmaking works, at least, is typically um, for a project uh, when you budget things out, you will lease a camera for a certain period of time. So what he would do is he would basically finance the acquisitions of these cameras by um, by getting a loan, buying the camera, then leasing it to the the production house or whoever he was was working with on the documentary. And that way, by the end of the shoot, because they've leased enough, enough days, he owns owns this camera outright. So he has, um, I think, four or five maybe Reds at this point. Um, he also knows the owners of Red very well. And so, um, yeah, equipment was, was never really an issue. And it, it also meant that, like, particularly early on when I was just getting used to using the cameras, um, that there were more, there was more than enough qu equipment to, to be working with and, and practicing with and that kind of stuff. Um, and I agree that, I mean, filming and, and photography are obviously two, two quite different things. Um, but I think particularly, well, one thing that carries across both of them is the ability to compose, um, compose an image and and that 
is is quite similar but yes there are like lots of techniques particularly when you're you're trying to tell a story um that are very very different and and that i had to learn pretty quickly um in order to to do what i was doing um yeah i i mean I, another thing that i think i found like was quite an adjustment was when it comes to photographing particularly um on the land um i i love like i love composition but my most or the the thing i find most important in my images is light and so i love shooting at dawn basically and at dusk or the the hours like just before and just after and then during the middle of the day you like go in, in southern africa for example you go back to your room you might get food you'll download photos you'll go through a few of them but there's kind of a chunk in the middle of the day where you you don't necessarily do that much. The thing about that when it comes to filming is you might miss a lot of behavior and a lot of um, kind of things that you want to tell a story about. And so with filming it, it often is is a little bit less about the light and the composition and, and all of those kind of things. And it's more about filming and capturing certain behaviors, whether they're unique or mundane. Um, it's about telling the story of, of that wildlife through the day. So uh, yeah, there, there are definitely differences, but I think having spent a lot of time around wildlife as well, I was able to more easily like predict movements. That's often very important when it comes to filming is, is being able to know, okay, like, is this lioness gonna get up soon? Is this lioness gonna hunt? Is like, what's gonna happen next basically? And, and being able to, to predict movements allows you to to wield the camera more effectively basically yeah makes sense well that's great um so when when we're talking about these uh netflix series and these nat geo series um let it help us understand when you're going out there is there a script that they are like hey it'd be great you know i just saw one of my friends he contributed to the polar bears um film that just came out they're documenting um you know the 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 mom and the cubs going through and basically like surviving in svalbard um, and, and showcasing all those things, but they kind of had like a little bit of idea of how to piece this, you know, they got the story and they're like, okay, hey, we need this shot, this shot, this shot. Is that kind of how, um, how it goes or what does that look like in terms of like knowing what to shoot? Yeah. So, so again, I think it depends on who you're shooting for. Some, some people have more concrete shot lists. So they're like, okay, we want this behavior and this behavior and, and these, these kinds of shots. We want this many aerials. We want this many time lapses like they maybe have more of an idea for others um it's a little bit more open-ended um yeah. like one of the the documentaries um we were working on was was on a white lion and we kind of didn't really know where the story would take us or what the story was going to be um and so for that it's much more about like filming every day as it comes and trying to film like what's happening every day, but also the unique behaviors to try and pull a story out of that. I will say that like, I've seen like what's been pitched before and like the kinds of shot lists that, that people want versus the end products. And often they're kind of completely different. It, I think a lot of it just depends because you can't really control nearly as much when it comes to wildlife. It's not like you're staging anything. So, yeah. um, um often you're at the mercy of whatever it is that you manage to capture. And so stories need to get reworked and all of that kind of stuff. So I think often teams will have an idea of the stories they want to tell. Um, but ultimately it will really just depend on, on what footage um, you manage to capture. Yeah. yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. And then that would vary obviously budget to budget, how long you can <laughs> survive out there um, in terms of yeah. like longevity of a project. So tell me, so Marion asked, you know, uh, you know, how close do you work with the guides? Cause like, like any wildlife photographer guys, like myself, I'm a wildlife photographer, you're a wildlife photographer, uh, access is king, right? Access is literally everything. If you can know where the animals tend to be, um, where, where to go in like, you know, where to zone in and, and hone in on, um, it's kind of everything. But in terms of like expertise, do you in, like leverage the guides that are in the particular areas? How does that work? Yeah. So so it varies place to place. There were some places we'd film where we'd be given um, given just a vehicle. We'd set it up with the 
the rig and we'd kind of be on our own to, to figure things out, but we might be out there for like weeks at a time. So we'd kind of learn ourselves um, like where we should be. There are other times where like we'd have, have a guide driving a vehicle or a guide in the vehicle at all times. Sometimes we'd be on foot with guides. Um, we definitely, like most places, will work very closely um, with whoever owns owns the land or owns the lodge or whatever it is. Um, but it will vary as to, to how often guides are there. I, I mean, guides are definitely um, most knowledge about no, most knowledgeable about whatever the 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 place you're shooting in is and and where animals are most likely to be as as you mentioned um but i think it also helped a lot that um so often i I'd, I'd be filming with russ and he grew up in in south africa has been filming um in the bush for the last like 20 or so years and so i mean not only is he incredibly knowledgeable but he's been to lots of these places before and so kind of knows um knows where to go um so yeah hopefully hopefully that asked answered your yeah answer definitely your i mean you know just to kind of recap what you're saying like combination of you know the locals the guides the people that are there every single day year in year out and then combined with the people that have a little bit of that more you know that greater experience almost like a mentorship it sounds like you know with russ and you know kind of knowing exactly you know that you can get a general idea and then you know he can be specific in terms of like his past experience um by the sounds of it is that is that kind of yeah summarized cool cool um lily asks uh just a quick question here uh her hero is david Attenborough. have you ever worked with him i have not worked with him i've worked with lots of people who've worked with him but i haven't worked with him directly <laughs> so it's in the pipeline <laughs> now um hey do you have any uh any footage or any photos um from these productions that you want to share yeah i mean i thought let me just pull up so i can um I can show you what maybe this gives you an idea of like the rig that so this was um filming some lion cubs uh, let me know you can see this right yep um, um so this is like this is the rig um inside the vehicle so with dangerous game typically you're shooting from inside a vehicle. Um, mm -hmm. And so we have like a, a crane mounted to the side of the car that's attached to a, um, a camera that's on a gimbal. Um, and then these controls that look like PlayStation controls <laughs> control literally everything. So you see like pan, tint, rolled. You have the, the record button. I've got my hand, my left hand um, ready to, to zoom in. Um, but, but hopefully that like, gives you an idea of the kind of setup. Actually, I, I think there was another video I wanted to show, but um, you also then, I know that someone said their favorite animals were wild dogs. Um, you also then with with non-dangerous game are often outside the vehicle. Um, so this is that's a sound mic yeah. that I have with me, but um, these are wild dog pups who are trying to figure out what I'm doing sitting on the ground um, as I was setting up a camera. Or actually, maybe that's Russ setting up a camera on the right of me. Um, but, cool. but yeah, I mean, hopefully some of the, like, often we don't share stuff from behind the scenes because we don't want to encourage people to do these. I mean, we're in environments where we know what we're doing we've been given permission by whoever it is um who, whose land it is like there are lots of caveats to this stuff so we yeah of course yeah to try not to share this like on social media and stuff but i think it's also interesting um it's interesting to see some of this stuff so this is obviously a an elephant we're outside the vehicle because we were just filming wild dogs um but you will see uh You'll see in a second how, so I'm sitting down and I think it's pretty rare that you're like sitting down this close to an elephant. It, yeah. It's like, um, <laughs> wow. Yeah. I was, uh, you don't really appreciate how big they are until they're right there. Um, Unreal. Yeah. That is super cool. Um, let me see. I think there was one other one. 
Um, so you can Yeah, you and I were chatting uh, just prior about, you know, the basically the the need to understand the, the wildlife behavior, um, get all the proper permissions and and how a lot of these shoots, you have to be extremely proactive uh, to get this type of access um, to make sure that you have all the safety protocols down pat, right? Yeah. Yeah. So these were um, newborn cheetahs that we were filming. So we'd driven like We'd heard that a cheetah was was about to give birth down on the Eastern Cape in South in, in South Africa, um, mm -hmm. and so we drove down 14 hours from where we were, just north of the Kruger, um, to go and try and see if we could make it in time for the birth. Long story short, we like missed it by 45 minutes because um, 45 minutes, well, because <laughs> Russ Russ decided to sleep in that morning. I was ready to go and. <laughs> Um, but we were trying to be the first people to capture a wild um, wild cheetah bath on camera, which has never been been done before. But we were there then for like the two weeks after they were born. And this is at least as far as we and anyone else knows, the, the youngest footage of, of wild cheetahs um, that's out there, which is partly why like Netflix and a lot of others have, have also been interested in it because um, you'll see... Like the the access and the shots that we got, like this mother was super used to being around people. So it's very, very rare that a mother would like even one that's used to being around people would let you be this close. Yeah. Um, but it was like the most insane couple of weeks being this close to little baby cheetah cubs who at least initially hadn't even opened their eyes yet. Um, so, wow, incredible. Yeah. Amazing. So uh, just some questions on the side uh, side here. So in terms of like the, um, like I, I feel wild dogs. I've, I've done that uh, before um, in Namibia and we were similar type of thing where we had the access and we were able to go there. But I, I know that when we had the, the adults, right, when we were filming the pups, basically they would circle us, check us out. And then they were super curious coming up to us. Like those, there was no uh, adults in that particular shot with the wild pups. So how were they? behaving in terms of your presence um yeah so so often the the wild dogs would go out to hunt during the day and they'd leave us with the pups this wasn't the case initially so we were filming them over the course of like three or four months and we came back every couple weeks or so and we'd film for a few weeks and then we'd go and then at, just to get that development but so initially um the the adults would be more skeptical. And like most of the time they would leave one of the adults there to guard the pups anyway. Um, so initially the, they were a little bit more skeptical and, and like if you would get out of the vehicle, the pups would go um, back into the den. Um, but it, I mean, a lot of it is just getting the animals used to you and, and showing that you're not a threat to them. So as long as you're not making sudden movements, you're not approaching them, um you're not making loud noises you're being quiet you're kind of minding your own business um eventually the animals one get more accepting and two um get more curious as you you saw with those those wild dog pups um so i think you'd be amazed at what the animals let you get away with when you spend multiple weeks or months with the same animals. They, they just become a lot more used to you, to you. Um, and that allows you to get, um, like even more incredible shots than you otherwise would have. Amazing. Uh, it's super cool to, to hear that. Um, I'm just trying to read through some of the comments. So guys, um, we're going to go into the, uh, the questions now, obviously we've answered some questions here uh, with Misha and I'm sure you guys have a ton more for him because we've been kind of chatting and showcasing some of the behind the scenes, uh, some of the process that was required for him to, you know, to, to contribute to some of these major productions. Um, I'm just going to go to Norman here. Norman says, so if you guys have questions, put them in the chat. We're going to try to answer as many as we can in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, Norman says, what was the most uh, profound um, or moving experience while filming? So out of anything, um, it doesn't have to be Nat Geo, just like kind of your your best experience, I guess. Yeah, I actually, okay, so pro, I'm going to put two experiences in here. 
Um, the first, it was probably, um, we spent a day um, with a mother and her, her cubs on foot, a mother cheetah and her cubs on foot. Um, and, uh, and the mother was hunting pretty much all day. So she had three, like two or three month old cubs. Um, and basically she would, she'd be walking through the bush. She'd see, she'd see a prey target and, um, she'd basically communicate with the cubs that they should sit down and be quiet. So they'd all just sit right next to each other. It was pretty cute. We would sit like, I mean, not right next to the cubs, but we'd sit maybe 10, 10 meters behind. Whenever the cubs sat down, we'd sit down and be quiet. Um, then she would stalk, stalk her prey, try and kill it. And she was like unsuccessful all day. And so she tried to, to hunt probably six different, um, Springbok and Diker, I think it was, um, that day, like all unsuccessfully, she was obviously like tired. It was getting towards the end of the day. Anyway, the, the kind of the last, we were getting ready to, to leave cause the sun was starting to go down. Um, and we sat down with the, the cubs again and she, um, finally managed to, to take down a, a Springbok and, um, she like calls the cubs over, they go running over and, and we, um, walk over behind them. We then like sit down and we're probably because we've spent like a few days with her and then spent all day with her. She's like completely fine us being there. We sit down probably no more than five or 10 meters away. And she's like choking out, um, this spring walk. Then she lets the cubs come over cause she wants to them to try and kind of be able to play with the animal a little bit. Um, and, it jumps up because I guess she hasn't fully choked it out yet. It jumps up and starts running towards us. And then she like jumps up and in one bound, just like smacks it back down right in front of us. Oh my God. Um, and then, yeah, that, I mean that, that whole experience, just being on foot and being that close to like raw nature, that, that was definitely one. Another was, was watching wild dogs take down. I mean, I've watched wild dogs take down a lot of animals, but, um, taking down a water buck um because it it put up a bit of a fight and and yeah it, i mean that was also gruesome i've seen lots of kind of spectacular kills but but yeah, yeah i think those two stand out wow amazing <clears throat> that's uh i mean yeah that's super unique to have all those encounters uh, i'm sure you have like a lot more probably tough for you to pin you know pin, yeah. it's tough for you to pinpoint one but uh let alone too. So um, just reading some of the stuff here. So Lily asks, um, so this is a, in, in a question that people often ask is, is the intervention piece. Um, have you ever felt like helping any of the animals? So obviously you've seen a lot of kills. You've seen a lot of different probably situations. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you and I have the same sort of opinion on this, but what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I, I don't think I've ever felt like I've wanted to help animals, I think, um, or like intervene in a situation. I think there are actually that's, that's not true. So there was one case with, um, with the mother cheetah where we were filming her newborn cubs. Um, so one day she went out hunting, um, and, uh, the cubs at this point are blind. They can't see anything. Um, they're basically, they're in the little den site that she's found for them. Um, but one of the cubs had kind of wandered off because it, it couldn't see, I mean, it can barely move. It like moves kind of like a worm. It's legs like don't even work when they're like a day old. Um, so it hadn't got very far from the den, but it was like maybe 10 meters away. Um, and it was, uh, it was just calling out. So it was doing it's like little mewing noise. Um, and the mother was nowhere to be seen. And that like mewing noise is only going to attract predators. So that was one instance where, um, it was like very difficult not to, to intervene because it's trying to, it's attracting attention and it has no idea like what it's doing is, is only going to get it killed. Um, yeah. so I think, yeah, that, that was one instance where it was difficult. Um, there was actually another one where, um, that first day 
uh, a part of the umbilical cord was still wrapped around one of the cubs' necks. Um, and so it was a lot smaller than the other ones and it wasn't able to suckle from the mom. That was also difficult not to intervene. Um, but generally when it comes to like animals killing other animals, I'm more just into it than anything else. So, um, yeah. uh, fair enough. Yeah. That's, uh, that's really great. Um, it's just, Oh, just to follow up there, Lily says what happened to the baby? So did it survive the, or did the it? mother the mother came back not too long after and picked it up and brought it back to the to the den. So the, the baby was okay. Um and uh yeah, we, we didn't pick it up or anything. <laughs> the little sigh of relief there from uh, Lily. So uh I'm gonna jump up to probably uh an interesting one. So does the mathematic uh mathematics degree ever come into use for photography? Um not not really. <laughs> No. Um, I mean, I think like the, one of the main things, I, I think in general, like th there aren't that many things that it would be that applicable for. The main thing is just, um, uh, it teaches you, and I think this is true of a lot of things, but like it teaches you how, how to think and think about problems and stuff like that. So I think more generally, just when it comes to like multitasking or be, being able to figure out and solve different problems um it's more just like how it's wired your brain more than like the actual things that it's taught you or the concepts yeah um, yeah no that's a it's a great great point uh abner yeah. says uh what are some things to be careful of when um uh videographing animals out of the vehicle so what do you what do you uh, um and what to avoid while doing video yeah i mean the so the main i mean there are quite a few things the main things when out of a vehicle or even in a vehicle um to not do are make loud noises make sudden movements um basically do any anything other than just like be chill and let things happen around you um and that's the same when you're on foot you also have when you're on foot you have to be a lot more vigilant particularly of um of dangerous game um and just, I mean, I think being aware of like what you should do in different situations um, is important. I don't think there's anything necessarily special about um, videography versus photography. I think uh, with photography, you have a little bit less gear. So you're maybe a little bit more mobile than you are when you have like a tripod and everything else. Um, but yeah, I mean, with with the wild dogs, sometimes I would carry a stick with me, particularly when we weren't that close to the um, to the vehicle, and I was on foot on with with the tripod and no one else near me. Um, but uh, but yeah, the only the only animals really to be scared of, at least in in southern Africa, are um, are the big ones like elephants and rhino, and then um, the only cats are, are leopards and lions, really. Um, the other animals, I mean, it, people often think that cheetah, for example, are dangerous. But uh, when it comes to fight or flight, they're a lot more likely to flee. Um, they generally don't at attack. Um, and uh, whereas lions and leopards are a lot more confrontational. Um, yeah, that's it cool. looks like uh, Lily also asked how close we were on the lion video. I, I found oh, yeah. a, um, a video that I can show to oh, okay. hopefully this. I think this is from a slightly different day, um, but hopefully this shows you. Um, so this is... on the controls and then Russ behind me. And then it's right there. But like different days, they would be a lot closer or a lot further away. Um, so like this day, this is footage rather than um, behind the scenes. So this, this lion cub had been super, super curious um, about the vehicle um and and the kind of rig out the side yeah. and i don't know if you can see 
but you can see in his, his eye, you can see the outline of the vehicle. Um, right, but he yeah. like walked, he walked right up, like in front of the, the camera and, and had been checking it out and stuff like that. Um, wow. Yeah. So is that, you said that rig is sort of ground level and that just connects to your monitor that you're looking at? Um, yeah, so the, the rig is basically a red on a, on a gimbal that's on a crane that's attached to the vehicle. So you can, so there'll typically be someone uh, moving the, the crane um, and, and that will allow you to bring it so that the camera is down um, to ground level if you want it like that. Um, yeah. But it also allows you to bring it all the way up um, if you if you want to be be higher. So, I mean, the range of, of motion is probably like three meters from the ground all the way up. Um, and then you can move it side to side. And the nice thing with that is it allows you to get like lots of motion in um, in the video. And so you can have the crane moving at the same time that the camera is panning you can also be driving at the same time and because everything is stabilized like it you can get these like silky silky smooth shots where kind of everything is moving but you're still focused on on the subject unreal super cool so uh, that leads me into my last question for you as we uh sign off today um so for someone who wants to become a wildlife photographer, wants to do, um, you know, what you're doing, what would be your, your piece of advice? Because it sounds like for me, how I'm interpreting this is you were out there doing it. You were just trying, you were doing it on your own, and then you cross paths with the right people at the right time, but you're out in the field. A lot of people that I speak to, um, you know, in my world, some of my students, everything, they, you know, they, they think it happens from behind the computer, right? They're like, oh, I, I, I need to chat with people but in reality i'm out there a lot of the time and i'm catching nothing i'm you know photographing grizzly bears and i'm just there's nothing there i'm going trying to find these animals nothing there so tell talk to us just as you sign off here about your the importance of being out in the field and and uh, getting your, your hands dirty yeah i i think that's super important i mean I, even being out in the field i would never have got the opportunities i i got if i didn't already have like a portfolio of work that that people would have been able to see and so i think um like going out there taking and it, it i mean it doesn't even have to be outside of your own country there's plenty of wildlife wherever you live um and so it's a question of getting getting a body of work together um, and refining your craft, whether that's composition, post-production, whatever it is, um, getting that body of work together. And then, I mean, I think people probably overestimate how difficult it is to get in touch with, with wildlife cinematographers and, and get into the industry. If you just reach out, a lot of these people um, will be open to it. Like if you look at the end credits on a bunch of documentaries and you find the Instagrams of those people and you reach out to them, um, you'd probably be surprised, especially if you have a, a body of work already, how responsive people might be. And if you say, hey, like, I don't want to get paid. I don't want to, I, I just want to tag along to whatever you're doing. Um, people might be open to it. I mean, things might have changed um, in the last few years. COVID has made kind of tagging along a little bit more difficult with lots of paperwork and like, people not wanting too many people on sets or or yeah. too many people in the film crew so maybe things are a little bit more difficult now but i think also just maximizing your kind of um your ability to get lucky if that makes sense so the more you're out in the field the more people that you're meeting who are in the wildlife photography or cinematography industry the more likely you are to to kind of get lucky and and someone wants to work with you or you get to work with them. Yeah, I, I think, but I, I do think that the going out and taking photos is kind of the, the first piece. Um, and you have to be willing to like, don't get me wrong. All of this stuff was, was super, super cool, but we were out there for like often 16 to 18 hours a day in like the 35 degree, I guess in the U S it's like 90, 95 degree heat. Um, you're out there 16 hours a day, most of the day, nothing is happening. You're sitting in a vehicle, you can't move, you're eating pretty bad 
food most of the time, you're not able to exercise, you're far, often you might be on your own for several weeks. Like there are lots of downsides. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And I think people like maybe don't see all of that part. They just see the like. The glorified. Because, yeah. Like, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I think like you also learn whether this is something for you by like going through the process of taking photos of wildlife. Like if you're willing to go out there every weekend and, and sit for hours to try and take photos of, of deer in your local park or things like that, I think then maybe this is for you. But I think a lot of people also think it's just kind of action all the time. And, and you go out for a couple of hours and, and take some crazy, crazy shots and then you're done for the day. A lot of it is, um, it's like being in uncomfortable positions for long periods of time and waiting for stuff to happen. Well, that's amazing. Well, we're, we appreciate uh, you suffering and putting, uh, you know, yourself out there and, and uh, having those hard, long days, uh, especially to contribute to things like Prince for Wildlife and, and you know, continuing to produce all these amazing documentaries. This has uh, been uh, amazing for, for everybody, I think. Uh, just final question, Martin says at the end, <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, are you shooting 60 FPS frames per second or do you switch as you go or is that dependent on this, the shot? Um, yeah, usually, uh, usually 72, but it, it kind of depends Se between 72 and 120 typically. Got it. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you again, uh, Misha and make sure you guys follow him on Instagram. I posted it, um, above there and, uh, be, be prepared when Prince for Wildlife goes live in our, uh, third year to, uh, to jump on, on that, uh, pilot whale shot. It's absolutely amazing. Um, again, thank you for your time, Misha, and super nice to meet you. Um, I know we'll be chatting a lot um, behind the scenes. Uh, it sounds like we got a lot of things crossing over. So uh, again, thank you for your time and I uh, look forward to chatting with you in the future. Yeah, th thanks for having me and thanks for all your, all your questions. And yeah, thanks to the audience for their questions too. It's been great. Awesome. Okay, guys, thank you guys. And uh, stay tuned for more live uh, Photographer Spotlight chats uh, coming to you guys very soon.